Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Welcome to this webinar on effective partnership working and collaboration. We're really pleased you could join us today, and I hope you find it useful. Um, I'm Alison Holdham. I'm a lead funding manager for Creative Confident Communities here at Esme Fairburn. Um, and today we're going to ask all the participants to uh, do an audio description of themselves. So I am an older white woman. I've got shoulder length, fair hair, um, and I'm sitting in glasses and I'm sitting in our office in London um, with some bookshelves behind me. And I'm joined by Mariana Hay and Emily Webb from Take Note, who will be leading the webinar today. And Tyler Atwood and Michelle Lee from Your Next Move, who will also be doing a presentation today. My colleagues Philippa and Luna are also on hand in the background to help with your with the question and answer session, but also with any questions that you might have or any difficulties you have with um, accessing anything during this webinar. I'm now going to hand over. Uh, I'll start with Emily and ask all the other panel members to do a brief audio description. Emily, if you could then hand on, that would be great. Thanks. Hi everyone. Lovely to see you all virtually. Um, I'm Emily Webb. I'm co-founder and co-director of Take Note and I'm also a producer at Good Chance Theatre with my other hat where we've created the Walk with the Mall and the Jungle among other projects and where we work in partnership with hundreds of arts, humanitarian and other organisations to create theatre with displaced artists across the world. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and just to uh, introduce my audio description. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with long dark hair and uh, bright orange earrings with a shelf full of wicker baskets of lots of random stuff behind me. Uh, Mariana, over to you. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm co-founder and co-director of Take Note. With my other hat, I'm also the founding director of a charity called Orchestras for All. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with blue eyes and blondie brown hair, and I'm wearing a hairband, and I'm speaking to you today from Edinburgh. Tyler. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Atwood. I'm founder and director from Your Next Move. We utilize hip hop culture to educate and inspire young people through participation, performance, and repeating the word education. Just to go for my audio description, I am a black man with brown eyes. My pronouns are he, him. My hair is long, but today is tied up with a hairband. I don't know if you can see that. And then I'll be passing over to my colleague, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Lee and a general manager at Your Next Move, working with Tyler. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a white woman. I've got... Uh, blonde hair just past my shoulders I'm wearing glasses and I am in the dining room in my house in Gloucester thank you thanks everybody that's great so just a bit more about today's webinar at ESME we know that working in partnership is key to achieving impact and long-term change for example our creative confident communities funding puts collaboration at the center of the funding priorities However, we also know that working with others can come with challenges and that working with funders, including Esme Fairburn, can be one of those challenges. So today we are going to hand over to Emily and to, uh, to uh, sorry, Mariana to do this work. But before we do, I just want to do a couple of bits of housekeeping for you, just a few details. Um, the live captioning is available for this session, so please click, click the closed captions button at the bottom of this window, and then you can see them within Zoom. You can post questions at any point using the Q&A facility, which you can find at the bottom of your screens. And I'd also encourage you to vote for questions submitted by other people if you'd really like to see that question asked, and you can do this by clicking the thumbs up icon, icon next to the question. We'll also, Philippa and Luna will be in the background. They'll be typing some responses to questions and we'll try and answer as many as we can. But if there's anything we miss, we'll try and answer them afterwards. So I will, just a little bit about Take Note. We funded Take Note's work in 2020. And the reason we did that was we had begun to see the growth of collaboration in the work we funded. And the way people approached us was, was changing as well. And we wanted to understand models that made collaboration work most effectively and how we can support and interact with them. So we're absolutely delighted to be hosting this webinar with Take Note today to share with you more about their approach and the practical tools they've developed to support more equitable and impactful partnership work. So I will hand over to Emily and Mariana. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alison. 
And it's really great to be here with you all today and have the opportunity to tell you a bit more about our work. So as Alison has outlined in her introduction, Take Note is a sector support initiative that's all about celebrating the power of collaboration, uh, finding ways to maximize its impact whilst also finding ways to overcome its challenges. The idea for Take Note derived from the direct experience of both me and Emily of leading small arts for social impact organizations. And in those roles, designing and driving a number of complex partnership projects together with other organizations. So we know firsthand both how great, but also how hard this kind of work can be. One project that I led, Where Music Meets, is an example of this. It was a project that brought together young people from Orchestras for All, which is an ESME funded organization that I founded that's all about opening up access to inclusive ensemble music making. And in this project, we brought together young people from Orchestras for All with other young people from projects across the musical spectrum. So classically trained musicians from the Royal Academy of Music, hip hop and R&B artists from East London Arts and Music, and young jazz musicians from the National Youth Jazz Collective. And together with that group, uh, we work with them to co-create and co-compose a new musical work that celebrated their collective musical diversity. To give you a sense of the scale and ambition of this project, I'm gonna share with you a short clip of the final performance of this work, uh, which happened at Lee's Arena. Uh, on stage, all the young people who were involved in co-creating the work, there's about 25 of them in total dotted about the stage, performing alongside the 120 members of National Orchestra for All. So as you can see, this was a really ambitious project with, I think, quite amazing artistic outcomes. The collaborative element of it allowed us to deliver an extraordinary artistic experience for all the young people, elevating their roles as both co-creators and co-composers. And it also exposed all the young people to a, a wide range of new musical styles and genres. On the practical side, the nature of bringing organizations together in this way meant we were also able to build a much bigger audience for that performance that you've just seen. And we were also able to pool and share resources such as musical equipment, which helped with our costs. But, and what the video doesn't show you, it was also a really, really challenging project. Orchestras for All had to drive every element of it from its inception to raising the money, planning out the logistics of delivery, not just the end result that you've seen there, but also all the workshops that went into co-creating the piece, as well as rehearsals with the full ensemble. We then had to wrangle people from each organization to evaluate the impact of the project on behalf of their young people, uh, report this back to us. We then had to compile all that together and then report all this back to our funder, uh, Arts Council England. So the experience, despite its many benefits, made me quite cautious about embarking on future partnership projects of this scale, especially when our own team at Orchestras for at that time was so small and overstretched. So why should we collaborate when it's this challenging? Well, at Take Note, we really believe that we've got to get much better and more creative and strategic about working together and finding ways to collectively overcome the shared challenges that we're all individually trying to address. And I think we've also got to find ways to connect with partners outside our own sectors to bring in new ideas and, and new ways of working together. Over three years of action research at Take Note, we've been testing our hypothesis about collaboration and what it can achieve with evidence of this drawn both directly from supporting partnership working out in the communities. To date, we focused our work primarily on partnership projects, but we're now starting to apply much of what we've learned to longer term strategic partnerships too. And as you can see from the slide, the impact of, of working together is striking, ranging from opportunities to share knowledge, amplify ambition, and perhaps most importantly, 
uh, working together to catalyze real systemic change. Many funders, I think, also want to see evidence of collaborative working in the projects that they're funding. And I think they're starting to recognize that there's more they can do to fund this kind of work properly and support its unique complexities. And we'll talk a bit more about our work with funders and Esme in particular later in this presentation. And that's really where Take Note comes in. So together with our founding funders, the Footwork Trust, as well as Esme, we set out to develop ways of supporting organizations to work better together to maximize their collective impact and also help them overcome the challenges of working with others. And over the past three years, we've been able to offer both funding and support to five partnership projects across the country, delivering a variety of arts-based uh, projects, exploring issues such as human rights, food poverty and youth engagement. Our work has brought us into contact with a wide range of organizations from grassroots community arts organizations and food banks right through to Amnesty International and the NHS. And in addition to our core projects, we've also been developing other models to support organization on a bespoke basis to help develop their own partnership practice uh, through working across our partnership portfolio of over 20 organizations. Through all this work, we've developed a series of tools and resources in the form of our collaboration guidebook, um, which is aimed to help support collaboration every step of the way from joint project development, planning, delivery, and evaluation. Um, and throughout creating these resources, we've always tried to keep overstretched organizations working at maximum capacity in mind. So to this end, and to help people who've got very little time prioritize, we've developed our three golden principles and their accompanying tools born out of our research and our feedback from organizations that we've supported. And if you can, we'd always try and recommend uh, trying to incorporate these principles every time you work in partnership with others. The first of these principles is to clarify your why, to make sure that everyone involved in the project uh, is aligned around the shared impact you want the work to have. The second principle is to take time at the start to lay the strongest possible foundations for your work together. This includes allocating roles and responsibilities, drawing up partnership agreements and addressing any potentially challenging power dynamics across the group. And finally, the third principle, to make sure that as the project develops, try and give as much time and attention, not just delivering the activity, but also to the, to the work with each other and the partnership itself. As we go through each of these principles in more detail and um, share the tools with you, please bear in mind these tools aren't meant to dictate or to be used exactly as we've suggested step by step. They're more there as prov provocations really to help you think about how you approach partnership working at the, at the moment, what maybe sometimes you miss uh, and to work out which bits, if any, you might like to take forward into your own collaborations and projects. So to go into a bit more detail on clarifying your why, um, the, the first golden principle, as Mariana said, that we've established over the years of our action research and from our own experience of running small arts organisations is that it's really fundamental to talk together about why you're undertaking this collaboration. And we know from, from our experience that it's easy to go into a partnership kind of assuming that you are doing it for the same reasons and have the same goals, but actually to clarify that and to work through the differences that might come up through those conversations and agree what you're all aiming towards together feels so fundamental to a successful collaborative project and a successful partnership. These questions, my slides are just being a little slow. Um, questions are about to appear on your screen, uh, which are the kind of key ones that we would recommend asking. So what's the impact that you're trying to achieve? What's the need for the project that you're thinking of doing? And why do you each individually as organizations want to do this project? And discussions around these will help align the partners to kind of rally around the reasons that you all feel passionate about this project. And to be really clear from the outset about what you're trying to do so that you can come back to that as a kind of calling card further down the line. We're very aware that developing this thinking takes time, but it does, from what we've seen, consistently strengthen the partnership throughout the project and the impact of the project itself, which, of course, is why we're all doing this in the first place. And that that final question is something that we hadn't actually realised 
was so key when we started our take note work but we've found that partnership projects really are at their strongest when each organization can kind of track back to their own organizational objectives and really explicitly make the case to themselves that the work isn't only achieving something positive in and of itself but it's also supporting each partner involved to further their own missions which helps with buy-in and commitment to the project throughout it we have a tool for this in the collaboration guidebook to help organizations identify their own goals um, but for the sake of this presentation each of our golden principles we've just picked a couple of key tools to shine a light on rather than going through the whole guidebook as that would take a while um, and so to go into the first of these the the first tool for clarifying why you want to do this project is a really simple one. It's essentially a set of questions that we've devised through and with our partnership projects around key things that we would always recommend asking. Firstly, to yourselves before you embark on developing partnerships and then as a group of partners, which are centered around the key questions that I outlined before around impact, need and organizational goals. And then our top key tool is undertaking a collaborative impact map or theory of change. We know that many of you will have done theories of change before, or some of you may not have done, um, but the difference in how we take you through the step-by-step -step processes and doing this with partners in coming together to do it collaboratively and using it as a, as a conversation and a, a clarification to come back to throughout your project and to check in and make sure you're on track with achieving your aims and your outcomes. And you can see here an example um, of a completed impact map from the other project funded by Esme Fairbairn Foundation in Gloucester, as well as um, Your Next Moves project. This project was led by Gloucester Cathedral with cross-sector partners, including a photography charity, a refugee support organisation, an access charity and the NHS. So lots of organisations coming together from very different sectors with different ways of working. And they used our step-by-step -step guide, some of which you can see on the screen now, which supports partners to do this collaboratively and writing individual versions of the mission and challenge and then coming together to share these and refine a collective vision, dividing into groups to consider outcomes for uh, the people that the project is working with, and then sharing these back with the group and agreeing a set of outcomes that speaks to the whole project, as well as checking in with the wider organizational objectives for all the partners. And this group and the other groups that we've worked with found it a really beneficial process. It's one of the tools and approaches that we have found from the reports from organizations as being most valuable, especially when working cross sector, being able to come together and create a set of shared vocabulary that you all buy into and agree on feels like it's a kind of fundamental core of, of what makes a successful partnership project. So the second principle uh, set up is key. We've consistently found that collaborations are most effective when partners build those strong foundations and take time to plot out each partner's roles and responsibilities and create a culture of shared accountability, clarity and commitment from everyone involved. Agreeing all that at the start of the project and getting as much of it down into a comprehensive partnership agreement makes it much easier to keep everyone and everything on track as the project develops and inevitably gets more complicated. And we've consistently found that when partners invest this time and resource at the start, things, perhaps not surprisingly, are much less likely to go wrong further down the line. As part of the setup period, uh, taking the time to address any power dynamics and the importance of doing this is something that's come up frequently, both in our action research and through other research, for example, um, by uh, uh, studies around partnership equity led by King's College London. We all know that diversity in partnerships adds huge value. Uh, and indeed, that's why lots of us might partner together in the first place. Uh, but it can also present real challenges, especially when bringing together organizations of different size, scale and status. So we have a tool that helps partners to acknowledge and address how variations between them could affect the ways in which they work together. And using this simple uh, power dynamics tool as a springboard, we hope it can facilitate open conversations between the group and help partners to assess honestly where power imbalances might lie and how to mitigate against these. 
Uh, as well as this tool, we've got lots of practical resources that support open lines of communication uh, and help ensure a fairer distribution of workload. For example, partnership agreement templates, a collaborative project planning tool, and also a set of questions that will help you evaluate your project collaboratively and equitably. And our final golden principle is to give the partnership as much love as the project. Of course, we totally understand the need to get stuck into planning and delivery of the project and how little time there often is available to do this. But if you are able to allocate some time and resource to the partnership itself, particularly by having meetings uh, at key points through the partnership cycle and creating space to check in on the health of the partnership at these meetings rather than just the details of project delivery, it makes a huge difference. We know only too well from our other roles how precious and limited time and resource can be, but one of our hopes is that these tools themselves can maximise that scarce time and also that the, we believe the things that we're recommending um, really do feel worth it. Um, so in terms of those key meetings that I mentioned that we call huddles, I'll just give you a brief overview of how we how we suggest structuring those. So the huddles are essentially four partnership meetings that form the backbone of the take note model. And once you've prepared the partnership and decided who you're going to partner with and why, we then suggest the whole group comes together at key points throughout the project. Firstly, in the setup to clarify the why, as we've talked about at the beginning, then to have a kickoff meeting where you're agreeing the roles and responsibilities and collaboratively planning both the delivery and the evaluation of the project. Then crucially to have a check-in huddle in the middle of the project to review progress both on the partnership and the project itself. And then to have a wrap up huddle at the end, which enables you to have that collaborative evaluation of the project and the partnership, and also to reflect on partnership successes and challenges and to establish how you want to take those through into other collaborative work with other organizations, as well as where you want to take this partnership project next, if at all. Um, and none of this is rocket science, but we found it to be a really valuable structure for having those moments of connection and communication. And at the start, we as Take Note facilitated these huddles, but we are very aware that we can't always be in the room and wanted to create a tool that any partnership group could um, take through, take themselves through the huddles. So our huddles tool suggests an agenda for each meeting, flags which tools from the guidebook might be useful at each stage, and then also has some facilitation suggestions based on what we've learned and what we found works best to create a supportive and collaborative and open environment. And to achieve that connection and communication, one of the tools that we created is this uh, partnership health check, which is essentially a set of prompts. And each one is based around our partnership values that we lay out at the start of the collaboration guidebook. And it's for each partner to use at the midpoint of a partnership or as many times as you want throughout. And against each prompt, for example, in this, in the communication section, there is open and frequent communication among partners. The partner then rates whether they feel the partnership hasn't yet begun doing this, whether it's emerging, established, or the partnership is really excelling. And essentially that can become a starting point for a conversation to compare where you feel the partnership is at around these different themes, identifying any concerns or sticking points or differences of opinion, uh, and also using it as a chance to celebrate why, where, where you're doing really well in a particular area. And now we're going to move on to hear from Tyler and Michelle, who have indeed used some of these tools and hopefully um, how they have found them valuable. So I'd like to welcome back Tyler and Michelle to the Zoom. Hello. Uh, and Tyler, as founder and director, and Michelle as manager at Your Next Move, were integral to the project that we worked with them on at Take Note. Your Next Move is a really brilliant community interest company that uses hip hop culture to inspire young people in Gloucester. And Your Next Move was the lead partner on a collaboration between them, a um, youth music organization called The Music Works, which is also funded by Esme, a community center and food bank, a friendship cafe, a youth support team and the police. And this partnership project, which was funded via Take Note by Esme Fairburn and supported by Gust as our partner and incubator for new projects in Gloucester used hip hop DJing, graffiti and other art forms to explore food poverty and to give young people a space to express themselves and the challenges they encounter around this and created a film of this work among other things. 
So we are really delighted to have you both here, Tyler and Michelle, thank you so much. And Tyler, I'll pass over to you to hear a bit about your experience of partnership working. Thank you, Emily. Hello, everyone. Just to say again, thank you very much for having the opportunity to be here. It's great to be able to speak with you all about the work in which we're able to do which was funded and supported by through Take Now via the Esme Fairband. And the impact I feel that this project was able to have is something that has been massive. And I think it's, there's ways in which it's been able to push forward a number of different aspects of it that's, that's taken place within Gosta. And to particularly hone in on those particular things is something that Emily had just mentioned. I want to be honing in on, in particular, on partnership working. As an organization, we work a lot in partnership with organizations, but this project would take note, support, allowed us to do things differently. A few examples of this are, firstly, we were able to take more time to build the project together, making it right for the people we were trying to reach, as well as right for the partners. This meant we were able to adjust the project so that it worked for partners of different sizes and with different capacities. The second point would be that this project actively encouraged us to form partnerships with new types of organizations from different parts of the community. For example, a particular partnership with the Barton Street Policing Team with a particular Police Community Support Officer or PCSO. This relationship itself was very important for us to be able to have as it meant that we were able to have new young people come to our programs and reach people in the community that we hadn't worked with previously. And then the insights of that PCSO themselves was also very important in terms of their experience of working with vulnerable young people. They were really informed about those particular ways to, to approach building these relationships as those relationships themselves can be very hard to build. And they were also informed in the way in which your this move now works. And because of that cross collaboration with them, we've been able to then continue that partnership and then it's extended beyond working with that particular PCSO. And we've been able to then work with others from the Barrow Street Policing team up until this point today. The partnership from their perspective was also very positive as it meant that they were able to come to the work in which we were doing in their uniform. And it meant that the young people will be able to start to recognize them through their uniform. But Aside from that, it also helped to break down to a degree some of the barriers that exist between young people and having a positive association with the police force of Ingosta. So that was something as well, which was great to touch upon. Then thirdly, there's been a longer term impact of this project on the way in which people and organisations in Gloucester work together. Over the years that Gloucester has been growing within the creative sector, there has been a growth in the amount of partnership working and more of an openness to share existing work, work practices and learning to help better work to be more impactful within Gloucester's communities. And this work has happened on a cross sector scale. The CCC project though, has been a key example of this within Gloucester's creative community where unconventional partnerships, I would say, across sectors has led to a very positive outcome. And cross-sector partnerships, as previously touched upon, had taken place. But I feel that the Take Note project has really encouraged this to even happen on a further, bigger, larger scale. Gloucester is on such a journey with lots of people really starting to work together on larger scales. And Unix Move is really proud to be able to be a part of that. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so Tyler has mentioned the difference the Take Note approach to partnership working um, had on the project itself, but also on the, the wider, longer term impact on the communities that we're working with and with the sector in Gloucester. So I thought it'd be helpful to talk about some of the tools and the approaches that we worked through with Take Note that we found particularly useful along the way. Um, so firstly, I'm going to talk about looking after the partnership. Um, partnerships can be complicated and things, as um, uh, Mariana talked about with her example, um, it can be challenging and uh, require a lot of work to actually manage effectively. Um, I think it could just be really easy to dive into the, this exciting project that you want to deliver and think about what needs to be done when and just get on with the delivery. And that happens because um, 
uh, that well, when we're working with um, organisations of different sizes, capacities in different sectors, everyone's got it, these projects fitting in with their wider work that they're doing. So it's just easy just to kind of dive in and um, get on with that delivery. As much as we want to give that time to talk as a partnership and work out how we can do things better and communicate, um, sometimes it just doesn't get that attention it deserves. Um, so this is where the project um, would take note felt very different for us and had a big impact because we took time to think about how well or not um, we were working together as a group um, when we came together. So an example of what guided us to do that was the partnership health check. Um, so we take note of support when we came together as a group, we took a moment to pause and ask ourselves some questions like how well we were communicating, how um, whether we were feeling clear about our roles within the project and whether we thought there could be things we could do better. Um, so just some examples. Um, at the beginning of the project, um, there was uh, the partners weren't as clear on the shared vision um, and that really improved throughout the project once we'd come up with the impact map collectively. Um, and secondly, later on in the project, one thing that was flagged was communication. And that was because there were lots of different partners of different sizes of engaged in different ways. And that prompted us to think about who needs to be updated, when and how. So we just shifted our communications with the partners slightly. So that was a really two kind of specific examples of how it supported us. Um, so secondly, um, being really clear on what we wanted to achieve for the project and how we wanted to do this, um, we were really supported with, with Take Note. And um, one example is the impact map. Um, going through that collectively as a group was particularly useful um, and having a framework to do that. We are all different, different organisations from different sectors and of different sizes. So us to take the time together to say, why, why this group and why are we doing this? really helped um, with our shared vision. Um, we thought about what we wanted young people and families to experience, what kind of what we wanted them to feel through taking part in the project, um, what we wanted to see the project achieve long term or what the legacy might look like. And it was just a real hook for us. Um, so when we came to decision making, we could go back to the impact map to guide us through those questions or next steps that we wanted to take. Um, so overall, uh, these tools have really encouraged Tyler and I and the team to think about um, what does partnership work in? Um, what, what work does this really involve for everybody that gets involved? So um, what resources, what do we need to build into funding applications and project plans to really hold and manage a project like this? Um, so that learning overall has been really, really important for your next move. And um, yeah, that's, that's from me. So I'll hand back over to Emily and Mariana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler and Michelle. It's so helpful to hear firsthand about your experience. Um, and there will be a chance to ask Tyler and Michelle further questions at the end uh, as well. So as part of our action research, we also wanted to find a way to create a fundraising application process that to our minds was fit for purpose in relation to partnership working. Traditional fundraising applications are, as many of you will know and experienced, inherently singular activities, usually involving one person from one organization sitting at a computer writing each stage of the proposal. The problem with this from a collaboration perspective is that it puts all the pressure on one organization and thereby creates an imbalance of work right from the beginning. Moreover, it doesn't really give the funder any sense of buy-in from other partners, a sense of the group dynamic or the motivation for working together. So we wanted to design a process that cultivated a, a culture of shared responsibility and commitment from everyone involved right from the start. But that also gave us, as the people making decisions about funding, a clearer picture of the group and its dynamic. The most effective way of doing this, uh, and we tried a few different ways, um, was to integrate the co-creation of the project impact map that Emily talked about into the second stage of the application process followed by a subsequent individual reflection from each member of the group on how they found the process of creating that impact map, their own personal motivations for taking part in the project, and also any reflections they had on the strengths and potential challenges of the group and its dynamic. So this allowed us to both hear individually from everyone, whilst also building in a collaborative activity right from the beginning. 
Through funding partnership projects in this way, we've now learned quite a bit about what organisations require funding wise in order to work effectively together and what works when it comes to joined up fundraising. Uh, so in addition to our collaboration guidebook, we've also created a toolkit, we've called it a blueprint for funders in which we've highlighted our, our top three golden principles again uh, for how partnerships could be more effectively supported. So first, we suggest that additional funding should be made available that supports the group to come together regularly and to give the partnership uh, as much love as, that, as the project, that golden principle that Emily talked about earlier. And then in terms of the application process itself, we strongly recommend creating opportunities for the group to come together during the fundraising process and suggest, if possible, that this, this time should be compensated and paid for by the funder. And then as a follow up to this group activity to also build in a way for each individual voice to be heard. So at this point, I'm delighted to be joined by Alison from Esme again. Uh, Esme and Alison in particular have been brilliant champions of our work at Take Note. Uh, and we're so pleased that she's able to share a few reflections on Esme's own approach to supporting partnership working. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Mariana. So um, at ESME, our learning about funding collaborations has highlighted three issues to consider. And for us, that's capacity, equity and power. So how do we know that our processes are not creating an unequitable uh, sharing of workload amongst the partners? How can we be sure power is shared equally among partners? How do we ensure that a collaboration is not working against or causing a shift in an individual organisation's aims? And how can we communicate with partners? How can we communicate with everybody in a partnership? And when we looked at those three areas of learning and looked at uh, the golden principles that uh, the Take Notes Blueprint document provided, we could see such clear um, overlap. So I wanted to just sort of address those in, as, as uh, each of those golden principles. Um, so the first one, which is about fund partners' time to collaborate well. So actually in our funding guidance uh, FAQ section, we actually do say you can include anticipated costs of setting up and coordinating networks or partnerships in your application. But perhaps we should make that clearer because it's in the FAQ, it's not right on the front page of everything. In practice, almost everyone applying to, a, to support a network or a collaboration does apply for funding for a post to run it. And if they don't, we advise them to do that. And we advise them to add costs to any bid coming to us to do that. Far fewer people apply for costs of each partner's involvement. And that's something we should probably be more aware of and encourage because we could consider those costs. Far fewer people apply for the cost of setting up a partnership. And we've looked at this to try and work out why this might be the case. And I think the problem for this is that by the time an application reaches us, the preparatory work, some of it has already been done. Some of the relationship building has already happened because of the type of information we, we require to process a proposal through to a grant. So we need to look at alternative routes to funding the pre-collaboration stage. So we're thinking now, could we offer small grants, for example, through a dedicated fund for collaboration building, or could we use some of our other tools like Funding Plus, so that we could fund the cost of making the connections or feasibility work. Now we have sometimes done that in the past, particularly for those types of collaborations that are a really strong fit to our strategy when we're developing our strategy. And it's really mutually beneficial for everybody involved, including us, but we need to think through a bit more clearly when and how and when we can offer that type of payment and make sure we understand what our role is as a funder in that type of arrangement. If I look at the two, uh, the second and third golden principles, I'll just consider those two together because they talk very much about the application process. And when we were considering about how we fund collaboration, we looked at our current funding pro pro process now, of course, that requires a lead organisation for governance and financial management purposes, and we usually pay the money to one organisation. So what we need to think about is how we work within those constraints, how we include and communicate with more partners. So, for example, we could uh, have more than one contact on a proposal, or we could ensure that our relationship goes with on, beyond the main lead partner for every communication that we have with you, whether it's the grant offer or the mid-grant calls or any other conversation. So we might not actually be able to shift far enough to fund people individually, but we might, we're looking at other ways that we can involve more partners in the relationship with us. We do ask that partners are involved in online meetings and calls uh, as part of the assessment process. And we do ask for confirmation from partners of the terms of their involvement 
uh, and making sure how that collaboration helps to maximize the project's impact. What is the impact that being involved makes helps them to achieve and trying to understand the roles that partners take, uh, particularly around decision-making and what expertise they're bringing. However, we know our application process is just not tailored in a way that would encourage partners to work together during that application process. That lead organization role really works against that. And we don't require a theory of change or an impact map. And one of the reasons we don't require that is that we know they take time and resource. And if we made that requirement of the proposal, we'd have to consider funding it, which obviously adds more consideration to how we do that and looks back at our tools again. So that's quite a tricky one for us to, to work out. Finally, in the blueprint, there is a note from Take Note about the funder-wide approach and, and, and really trying to call a call for funder-wide approach to collaboration. And we are bringing Take Note's work and other models of collaboration that we see through our funding to the attention of other funders, and particularly when we collaborate with them on funding projects. Um, and we're learning from all those collaborations that we support Particularly at the moment, we are part of a very big collaboration called Local Motion, which is a group of funders and six part uh, partner places. And that program is going to have a huge impact on how we work with other funders and how we collaborate and how we collaborate with multiple grantees and what processes we learn through that that are going to enable that to happen best. Just a kind of closing comment, we do appreciate that the funding sector is not currently set up to support partnership well particularly in terms of the governance of individual charities, the way applications um, um, are uh, created and the grant relationship. But most organisations and especially funders need partners to deliver their work. And so Take Note's work has really made us think about the potential of partnership, the time, the energy lost through the current arrangements that we as funders ask people to do, re-granting, commissioning, negotiating. So we are going to take this further. We're going to think much more about how we can make our, our processes a magnifier rather than a diluter of impact but all of that at the moment is a work in progress so I'm going to hand back to Mariana and Emily thank you thank you so much Alison it's really amazing to hear your reflections on all of that um both in terms of your your honesty but also really exciting to hear how you might take some of these things forward particularly around funding partnership development work and it also involving more um partners in the relationship with esme that feels like a wonderful um kind of potential legacy for all of the work that we've been doing and, and the collaboration that we've had with you so thank you so much for sharing that I can see a couple of questions coming up in the Q&A boxes that relate to some of what you've just been talking about and um so we'll come to those Leslie particularly in in the Q&A section but just to summarize before we go to those questions we know that we have shared a lot today and there is lots more that sits behind it in the guidebook and in the research findings on our website but we each wanted to just close by sharing a top recommendation um, from take note and your next move around partnership working because we totally appreciate that everyone is super stretched and capacity is one of the biggest challenges we're all working at a million miles an hour um so it would be i think just to kind of distill a couple of the top key things if you can only do one thing would be fantastic. Michelle, I was wondering if you'd be happy to kick us off with a top recommendation. Yeah, I'll go. Um, my recommendation is to um, take time out at the beginning of the project um, to think about any concerns or any kind of sticky bits that might come up throughout the project and being honest about them. So it's really about taking value, um, honesty as a value into the project and then having a conversation when things are less stressful at the beginning about if this comes up, how might, might we explore this together? Then I think we can be much better equipped if and when that sticky thing does come up during the project. I'll hand over to somebody else. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Tyler, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. And I guess mine would be about having conversations with potential partners right from the offset from the very beginning even when you're applying for something so you can get a clear understanding of where everyone is at. I feel that if you bring people in at different stages of the process, things can get quite complicated. You may be tempted to bring people in when it seems relevant because their expertise may be better placed to be at a particular point. But once you've conceived the idea, having that conversation straight away so that you're communicating really clearly and addressing any potential dynamics up front and giving people a full picture from as early as possible. So you may 
also get an understanding of where the skills may be better placed in other elements of the project that may necessarily not have first come to light by having a conversation with them at that early point is quite important. So illustrating the fact that communication is key. Brilliant. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Michelle. Totally agree. Uh, and in terms of take note sort of recommendation, I think we would say that even with the limited capacities that we um, have talked about a lot, we would recommend that if it's possible to have regular check ins with partners and have a standing agenda item on your other kind of delivery meeting uh, agendas to talk about the partnership itself, check in about how things are going, celebrate successes and address challenges before they become problems so that you can find solutions together and stay connected, um, then that would be what we would say is a kind of easy insert into project meetings that you'd be having um, anyway. We wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who's helped us develop this work and all of these tools, particularly to Esme and to Alison uh, for your funding and your support and for giving us this opportunity and all of the Esme team who've made this webinar happen today. Thank you to Footwork as our main and founding funder, to the brilliant Tyler and Michelle for sharing your experiences today and for the amazingly impactful project that you created with us. Um, and to everyone who's joining the webinar, we really appreciate you out there in the ether um, and to your for your questions as well, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, Esme Febben have shared a copy of the guidebook and links to our other tools and this presentation in an email before the webinar. But just to answer one of those questions, we will uh, do this again by Esme uh, after this presentation. So you'll have a copy of everything that we have um, shared today. Please do use the guidebook as much as is helpful. We'd love to know how you use it. Um, and just before we go to the q and I'll very quickly come out of screen sharing uh, the presentation and just give you a sense of the guidebook as it exists. So this is our tools page, as you can see, and on here we have the collaboration guidebook, uh, which has all of our tools, the keystone tools that we've pulled out, some of the um, most important tools that we've created and shared with you today, the huddles where we have the agenda and agendas for all the huddles and the facilitation recommendations and the blueprint for funders that Alison was um, speaking to earlier. And all of these tools are available on our website, totally open access and free. So feel free to go there and, um, and have a roam around. And just so you can get a sense of it as a whole, uh, tool you can see in the contents that there are many many um, tools within the guidebook that you are welcome to to browse and that these all kind of are preceded by some some setup and and kind of setting partnership values and things like that and then we go into every one of the tools chronologically taking you through a partnership journey uh, from beginning to end so I will now stop sharing my screen and we will take a few questions, which I think I will just reopen the Q&A. Um, a couple of questions have come through from Leslie around, so I'll just read them out for ease. Can the main driver organization of the project charge more for doing that? That could cause a problem and acknowledging that if you are charging more for the partnership working, that can make the project a lot more expensive and sometimes it feels like that money would be better spent on projects directly rather than on developing partnerships. Esme might be one of the few funders that sees this process as beneficial so it means a lot of work for one funder only which is a bit of a catch-22. Um, totally hear you Leslie and just to take the first half of that question I think in terms of the main driver of a, of a project charging for doing that I suppose that's partly what Alison was talking about in terms of structurally as a whole sector there's a kind of shift that needs to happen but our suggestion would be that the budget builds in time to undertake the partnership working um within the funding application and that that time allocates the funding proportionately to how much time each partner will have to spend on the project so there is a kind of a parity in how much um funding people are receiving for the time that they're doing based on how much um, input they're having to have into that into that partnership. And to take the second half of your question, I, I totally hear you on when funding is so tight, not feeling able to put a huge amount of the budget into that partnership um, development. And I guess that is about the 
that balance of um, proportionately, of course, a small scale partnership is not going to be able to use all of these tools or do all of this partnership development work necessarily. But I suppose in acknowledging that it, there is a time commitment that is required to work in partnership at all, there is a kind of fairness in having that time um, compensated. And that hopefully, ultimately, that means that the project impact is greater because there is more capacity to put into the partnership to make the partnership strong enough that the the project can be benefited rather than the partnership being a drain on capacity that isn't compensated for. Um, Alison, I don't know. Emily, can I just quickly add to that? Yeah, the yeah, last sure. point is exactly, I think is the really important point for us is that the, it's about how much impact and if the impact is so much more escalated by working in partnership or collaboration, that that's the thing that we as a funder will be looking for is how does the impact of what you're doing get really, really larger if you're working in a collaboration and how does that balance against those costs? That's the kind of thing we would, that's how we would consider it. Yeah, thanks, Alison. Um, there's also another question anonymously, which touches on that, which is, does every partnership um, need to assign admin or chairing roles or can they be shared effectively? Um, Mariana, do you want to speak to the the thinking we've done around lead partners and and or sharing equitably those roles? And I, I think this is also potentially a question around that facilitation of the partnership and does that need to be externally managed from someone who's not actually de delivering the work itself and that's where take notes started um and recognizing that it's very helpful to have almost a sort of neutral party within a partnership who's not there delivering the work but can actually be responsible for holding the partnership together uh, and doing that kind of chairing of the meetings and facilitation but we recognize that that's not always possible to have. That's kind of ideal world scenario stuff. Um, and that's really why we've created the tools, particularly the huddles tool, which as Emily outlined, has got all the agendas of the meetings, as well as our kind of top tips for how to facilitate a meeting that ensures that all voices in that meeting are heard, that there's a kind of equitable spread of, of time for each organization to present or put forward what they might be struggling with or what they want help with. Um, so whilst it's not an ideal, an ideal and as I say like um, ideal state stuff would be having potentially a third party in there to help manage that facilitation and that brokering chairing we really hope that that tool will go some way to making those meetings feel uh, open honest equitable inclusive um, that's really what it's there to do but we are here in the background if you do ever want some help or advice on how to manage that yourselves please get in touch and we'd love to share a bit more with you about how we've approached that. Thanks, Mariana. Um, Alison, we've got a question from Ian about, um, as somebody who's dyslexic, is there any support that could potentially enable access to potential partnerships and Esme could support in that process? It's, it's a possibility, yes. And we do have um, an accessibility uh, offer as for people who are making applications to us and need some help. And if that was a part of the, the, the um, accessibility payment was to cover the building of the partnership and understanding that, then that's a possibility. It may also be something that we could look at through Funding Plus as well, how um, we can help to um, you know, support people through that through the, through the partnership process once the grant is in place as well. So there is a possibility of that from us on, on that case, yeah. And Ian, just to... Um reiterate in terms of this presentation um, which will be shared afterwards so hopefully in terms of being able to go back and read through the text in the presentation in your own time um, you are very welcome to do that and if you have any questions or want to uh, understand any more from us then you're welcome to contact me and Mariana directly about it too. And in terms of your other question Ian about how intellectual property works we actually haven't explored that in um, great detail at Take Note I suppose the partnership working uh, that we are talking about is not necessarily, it, the idea of the collaboration is that the work together is created together and therefore the intellectual property of things that are generated like the impact map, et cetera, would be a collectively shared um, tool that any of the partners would be enable, able to use. But in recommending doing partnership agreements, um, we would suggest that there's an intellectual property 
clause within those partnership agreements that makes all of that really clear. I don't know, Alison, Mariana, anyone else, if there's anything else to add to that. Great. Uh, just looking through. Uh, for everyone, there's a question from Gina around how you deal with people in your organizations or other partners who don't see the value in giving time to setting up or managing the partnership. Um, in terms of, I suppose, any challenges around partnership working, would anyone in the in the group like to take that? I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, go for it. I think this can be something which can crop up Maybe, I'm going to say frequently, but it's a very likely thing that can crop up, but it, it very much depends, I guess, on how you're trying to build your partnership, who you're building your partnerships with, what is the aim of the particular project. There can be a number of different things. I think if there is someone who doesn't see the value in giving the time to set up or manage the partnership, it makes sense to try to get to the root of the reason as to why they think that way. Do they consider the project itself to be a waste of time? Do they think that the resources could be better spent or better placed on actually delivering the work? Is it that managing a partnership or setting up partnerships isn't necessarily a part of their skill set? So because of that, it's not something which they're necessarily skilled at. Maybe it's something that they don't necessarily value as much or it's something they don't necessarily see the value in because it's something which is necessarily lying again within their skill set so there could be a number of reasons as to why they may think that way and ascertaining the reason as to why will also help then in addressing that same issue in the future it could also even be that maybe they're just not the right fit for the partnership so maybe it's that why are we trying to do this in the first place we can do this on our own if that is the the approach or the mindset in which they have and you've done your best to try and find the reason as to why they're thinking that way and that's what it comes to, then maybe it makes sense to say, okay, maybe you aren't particularly the right fit for this. I guess it makes it even harder if there are someone within the organization who is then trying to drive the partnership. You can't necessarily say to an, uh, someone who is one of your colleagues and say, okay, you can't be a part of this. Just if you can, then maybe that'll make it a bit easier. But if they're within the organization, which is driving the partnership, that makes it a bit harder. Uh, I guess it also depends on when, on their role. How do you need to address it? If they're in a very senior role and without having them on board, it makes it much harder to set up or manage the partnership, then it will require, again, a different, a different approach or a certain level of addressing the actual issue. So I guess... There's a number of different factors which then would dictate what might be the best approach to go to that. But I hope one of those approaches answers your question to some extent. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Tyler. And it's maybe worth saying that there are various tools in the guidebook that are kind of that, aiming to address that. So um, it's worth going there as well. I'm really sorry we've come to the end and run out of time for the last couple of questions, but I'll hand over to Alison and just to reassure you, we will answer those questions um, in the follow up. We will, absolutely. So a um, huge thanks to Mariana and Emily from Take Note and Tyler and Michelle from Your Next Move. Thanks to you all for joining. Uh, sorry, we've slightly gone over, but I hope you found the session really useful. The recording transcript and the answers to any questions we didn't get to answer will all be shared on our website. And we'll be sharing more of our learning from funding about partnership work and collaboration over the coming weeks on our website and on our social media channels. So please do keep an eye out for that. Finally, just thank you all very much and goodbye. Thanks very much.